Uh, main street policing meets military grade surveillance. Um, imagine you have a huge, 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 huge military organization and you do wars and the wars end and uh, you can't leave your military equipment on site, on place because someone else might use it for its own purposes. So you take all your, your stuff home. What do you do with this stuff? Um, you can give it to the police. You can bring military technology into more civilian regions um, so that suddenly the, the police looks more like a military organization, like a militia or so, and that you suddenly have tanks on, 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 uh, on protests or so. Uh, similar things happen with uh, surveillance technology that uh, when the war is over, the, the companies want to sell, want to continue to sell surveillance technology. So whom do they sell? To the more civilian world. Funny and not so funny idea. Um, Catherine Crump is talking about. Uh, I want to give you a warm. I want to give want you to give her a warm welcome. Applause to Catherine Crump and have fun. Thanks so much, and thanks for coming. You're the diehards who are still going to talks on the last day of camp. Um, I want to spend some time today talking about surveillance by local law enforcement agencies. We've spent a lot of time over the last few years talking about the NSA and the FBI. For good reason, Edward Snowden revealed a great deal of information about what those agencies are doing. But I think that for many Americans, the FBI seems pretty remote to them and they can't imagine um, being subjected to surveillance by the FBI. But their local law enforcement, sorry, I'm getting a fair amount of feedback. Um, local law enforcement agencies, on the other hand, are more realistic. And today, military grade uh, technology is increasingly being used in local law enforcement agencies in the United States. The best known example of this are, of course, military weapons. But what most Americans still don't realize is that sophisticated surveillance technology is also in the possession of even police in small towns. Fueled by billions of dollars of federal money, local communities are acquiring these technologies, often without the population knowing about it, and even without elected representatives being aware of it. Um, but there's hope. Fortunately, in liberal communities like Oakland and Seattle, thanks to activists, some of whom are with us at camp, communities are starting to push back and to put regulations on this technology. Um, and I think we need more people to join them. Um, but first, a bit of background. Um, in, uh, there's been a huge amount of controversy about, uh, about policing in the United States. Uh, when the police in Ferguson shot uh, and killed Michael Brown, uh, there were a tremendous number of protests after the fact. And Americans were shocked not only by what happened to Michael Brown and then unfortunately many others uh, before and since, but also by how the police responded to the protests that took place. Um, armored vehicles called Bearcats rolled down the street. Heavily armed SWAT uh, agents confronted the protesters. And I think it was the first time many Americans woke up to the fact that military-style tactics and equipment were being used in local policing. Now, activists had been raising the alarm about this for years, but it took this particular event to galvanize the American public. And it's even resulted in some reforms uh, to programs that donate surplus military equipment to local law enforcement agencies. Um, and just last week, Ferguson Police Department itself was uh, compelled by the Defense Department to return two Humvees um, that had been donated to it. Um, but we need a similar moment of awakening when it comes to local police departments use of surveillance equipment because Americans still don't realize that in particular tools of mass surveillance are available to their local police. Facial recognition technology I think is in some sense exhibit A uh, for this. Um, it's commonly it was used in Afghanistan and Iraq to identify people, um, but now local police departments are rolling it out as well. Um, the best example of this is actually San Diego uh, in California. Uh, San Diego uh, 
started working on facial recognition technology back in 2007, but it took six years uh, until the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, and the Center for Investigative Reporting uncovered the use of this program for anyone, even people who live in San Diego, to become aware of this. And what we learned was that not even elected officials realized that this type of technology was being uh, adapted. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about it. The San Diego program is called TAC IDs. Uh, these slides that I'm going to show you, they aren't actually my slides. They're slides from an organization called Argus, which is a regional law enforcement collective in the San Diego area. Um, so TAC IDs leverages a database of 1.4 million photos taken at local jails. Um, and in the field, officers use a mobile device to snap a photograph of an individual. That photograph is cross-referenced with the booking photos, um, and then uh, up to 10 matches are displayed to officers so they can see if the person they're interacting with is someone who's been subjected to, uh, has, has been arrested previously. It doesn't necessarily mean they were actually convicted of anything, it just means that they had some interaction with the criminal justice system that resulted in a booking. Um, so right now, uh, this database is limited to arrest photos, uh, but it's not clear how long it'll stay so limited. Um, the police department has speculated in public documents that uh, perhaps all driver's license photographs in California could be integrated into this database, uh, and perhaps also, instead of just snapping photographs of people, um, you can see on this slide that they have suggested uh, integrating this technology into fixed cameras in places like courthouses and on public transportation. Uh, so you can engage in a, a sort of scanning of the local population. Um, and what I think is so striking about this is, again, law enforcement agencies did, them, did this themselves uh, without the public being aware of it or without any elected representatives actually having a say, uh, which is obviously quite undemocratic. Um, so as of February, there are about 800 registered users of this technology, representing 28 different uh, cities, uh, in law enforcement agencies in the San Diego area. Incidentally, that includes not just local law enforcement agencies, but also uh, ICE, which is the entity that uh, is responsible for detaining and deporting uh, individuals unlawfully in the United States. Um, and, and many other organizations. Um, so this is not a crowd that needs an explanation for why facial recognition has some privacy implications, right? Um, and precisely because it eliminates much of the practical obscurity many of us appreciate in everyday life, this is exactly the type of technology um, that ought to be subjected to public scrutiny. Um, now, it used to be that if you were a police department in the United States, it was actually pretty difficult to roll out um, a substantial new technology without there being some oversight. And the reason for that is you generally needed money to do so, and to get money, you had to go to the local city council. And the consequence of going to the local city council, right, to ask for money, was there was at least some chance for local officials to scrutinize what you were doing, and because of open meetings laws, it meant there would be some pieces of paper out there available in the world that local activists could see uh, to know that this technology was being, that a new technology was being considered by their local law enforcement agencies, right? But that's not how it works anymore. And I think it's worth talking about why. Well, as in so much with policing in the United States, a lot of it goes back to September 11. Um, after uh, that tragic event, uh, there was uh, something called the 9-11 Commission, which examined, which con and conducted a comprehensive examination of why the U.S. intelligence services didn't manage to uh, detect and deter this event before it occurred. Uh, and one of the primary conclusions that this entity drew uh, was that um, homegrown terrorism was actually a substantial risk in the United States, um, and that far more information needed to be gathered about um, individuals in local communities. Um, and this, I think, is where a lot of the drive to collect it all on the local level came from. And once you've reached that conclusion, that integrating local law enforcement agencies into the broader federal surveillance system is really the only game in town. The United States, unlike some countries, doesn't actually have a national police force. Um, and in fact, there are 10 times as many local law enforcement agents in the United States as there are federal agents. And so pumping large quantities of money into local law enforcement agencies to acquire more invasive and comprehensive surveillance technology has been the strategy in the United States ever since. 
So I want to show you a few numbers, because sometimes that helps. There are these various grant programs that the uh, federal government created. Uh, a lot of them come out of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, they have a variety of names. Um, and so here are just some examples. And you can see that the amount of money is often quite large. So billions and billions of dollars are going into these programs. Um, and there are, in fact, so many different uh, pots of federal money that you could now use to acquire surveillance technology if you're a local law enforcement agency that, despite best efforts, it's actually really difficult even to count them all. Um, and the other thing this audience will be aware of is surveillance technology is cheap, right? Um, the Department of Justice also runs many of these programs. Um, and in an era when you can buy a license plate reader for $15,000, right, having billions and billions of dollars feeding into local law enforcement agencies has uh, really expanded their surveillance technology. It's also undermined democratic control. Um, and because, as I said before, law enforcement agencies used to have to go to local governments in order to get funding. Now they don't need to do that. They need to apply for federal grants. Um, and that's exactly what happened in San Diego. Um, the program was rolled out by this regional law enforcement collective. It applied directly to the Department of Justice for a grant to fund its facial recognition software. Um, and in fact, the program still appears to be almost wholly supported by federal money rather than state money. Um, so Argus uh, is actually a form of a fusion center that existed before fusion centers existed. Um, it has 82 members uh, of different law enforcement agencies. And the way it works is agencies deploy different technologies. Uh, they join the collective. Uh, one of the conditions of joining is that they feed all of their data into the overall collective. Um, and then they have access to everyone else's data. Um, and now Argus, which was based in San Diego, is experimenting with broader sharing, right? So instead of just being limited to San Diego, they're now exchanging a lot of information um, with other states like Arizona. And you can see how this is sort of a bottom-up approach to trying to broaden um, information aggregation about everyday citizens' movements in the United States. Um, so I've been talking about San Diego um, and the fact that no one knew what was happening with law enforcement acquisition of technology there. But it's not the only example. Um, and in fact, probably the most prominent example uh, is in Seattle. In 2010, news reports uh, came out that Seattle had acquired a drone. Um, it was a small drone. This, again, is a slide from the local law enforcement agency that they put out after the fact, describing, describing the drone, which I think is, is relatively modest compared to a lot of other drones. Uh, but, but one of the striking things about it is the city council members found out about the technology the same way as everybody else. They read about it in the newspaper. Um, and they were really both surprised and upset to know uh, that this kind of technology was being acquired um, without, without their knowledge. Um, so um, ultimately, the public outrage was so... Um, you know, so vigorous in Seattle that they actually ended up having to get rid of their drone. They tried to donate it back to the manufacturer who refused to take it, and ultimately their solution was to donate it to Los Angeles, um, where ultimately it actually also prompted such um, a vigorous reaction that it's been sitting in a warehouse ever since, and this little drone has actually never flown. Um, Oakland is another community. Uh, where this happened, um, and I know there are a lot of activists from Oakland here. So in 2013, um, individuals in Oakland learned that through a port security grant uh, from the federal government, uh, Oakland was developing what's called a domain awareness center, and the idea here was to integrate sensor data around Oakland into one station for more comprehensive monitoring. Um, you know, I think, again, this, this is an effort by the federal government to build up information collection. Um, and uh, so it was first funded with $3 million of federal money back in 2009, and then in 2013 they needed more money to implement phase two, which involved an integration of uh, a more broad range of data, and they came back and asked for uh, their approval to accept $2 million more million of federal money, and at that point the activist community caught on. And it was really important that they did so, because they could raise the type of basic questions about this technology that the city council members, despite good intentions really didn't know how to ask. And so um, the activist community really came together around this um, and really took advantage of public comment periods to um, voice their opposition. So someone said, had a comment like this, which is pretty representative, we're talking about a citywide surveillance program in which they might implement facial recognition. We don't know how long the data is going to be stored. We don't know what other agencies it's going to be shared with. 
Um, we don't know, uh, they're they were at that point talking about giving police agents in the street access to all of this sort of information on their tablets and laptops, and it, we don't know anything about how this data is going to be secured. Is it going to be available to any officer? to only a few officers, and the person ended by saying, there are so many unanswered questions that you really should put a stop to this until you've engaged in some sort of oversight. Um, and the city council in Oakland listened um, and responded to that, and ultimately, as I'll talk about later, and as Aesthetics talked about yesterday in a talk, um, really put some restrictions in place. I think there's something important to note about both the Seattle and Oakland examples, which is that um, they were both funded by federal anti-terrorism prevention grants, right? Um, but they were used for law enforcement purposes, and I think it's just um, an example about uh, how a lot of this technology is obviously multi-purpose, and because there's very little terrorism and lots and lots of crime, right, its most routine use ends up being for local law enforcement sort of routine uh, policing. Um, and so I think it's particularly damaging that it's sort of undermining um, accountability structures that have often been in place. Um, but you know, I want to talk about a hopeful note, which is actually both in Seattle and in Oakland, the activist community successfully pushed back on surveillance. Um, Seattle did something really pathbreaking, right, which I hope will be a model for a lot of other cities in the United States, which is they passed the first ordinance in the country requiring the local law enforcement agency to give it notice before acquiring surveillance technology, right, and then to present a plan explaining how they're going to collect uh, use, store, and share the data that's there, right? And so they mandated that people who live in communities actually have some shot at being able to control the technologies that will be used to surveil them. Um, and, and one of the heartening things was that a lot of the city council members were just as upset about this um, as the activist community. Um, and and uh, the person who sponsors this bill, a local legislator named Nick Licata, had this to say about it. He said, I want to talk about how we got into this situation to begin with. One day, some of us showed up to committee and there were some objects on the table. It turns out they were drones. We didn't even know we owned drones. We looked at each other and said, where did this come from? And someone said, oh, you approved it two years ago which, by the way, was true, uh, but they'd been asked to approve uh, the acceptance of $3 million of federal money to, quote, prevent terrorism, and had never been told it would be used to buy a drone. Um, and the city council member said, what is this about? And so this is the basic problem I wanted to tackle with this legislation. I want to say we are not going to be in this situation again. Um, and so I think we're all hoping that what Seattle did um, will lead to similar movements across the United States. Um, and the ordinance has provided for greater transparency. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a start. Um, and I've talked to people who live in that community, and they've told me that they actually think it has made a really big difference, because when police departments have to sit down and actually think, okay, what am I going to say to the public about how we're going to collect, use, store, and share their information, that has actually slowed down um, the rollout of surveillance technologies, because those are, can be very difficult questions to answer. And they also mean that you have to, like, figure out whether you can come up with a politically palatable response for people when you're gathering that type of information. Um, Oakland also successfully pushed back against the acquisition of surveillance technology, thanks uh, to several people who were here with us today. Um, it was a really interesting debate to watch. Um, you know, as in Seattle, there are just a lot of people in Oakland who work in the tech industry and are sophisticated about technology, and they were very concerned. But the other people who were really crucial in pushing back about this technology were members of the local lighthouse mosque who just came out in droves basically to say, you know, we have been subject to all sorts of surveillance already, which we think, you know, violates not only our privacy, but also our fundamental right to exercise our religion, right, free from government scrutiny. And it's not helpful, city council members, if you then also start aggregating this information in a way that it can be further shared. So, so these two communities um, came together and they succeeded first in limiting uh, the scope of the Domain Awareness Center so that it focused only on the Port of Oakland, right, since it's a port security grant to begin with. You know, and the port is already in such extensive surveillance that in some sense, I think, limiting to the port, rather than integrating sensor data citywide, um, actually substantially cut down on the scope of the program. Um, they did, then did something really innovative, which is they formed a city citizen committee to draft a privacy policy for the DAC and after about the Domain Awareness Center, and after about a year of work, the city council signed off on that policy. Um, and it's a really good policy. Um, 
that really thoughtfully addresses all of the questions that we all think about when you think about the sharing and storage of data um, that I hope will be a model. And this partnership was so successful that now um, they're going on to try to create um, an ordinance to regulate surveillance technology citywide, a more blanket ordinance. Um, so I think it might be fair to ask, who cares, right? So two liberal cities on the west coast of California, on the west coast of the United States, managed to actually poke some holes in this. Um, but I actually think it's deeply threatening to what the federal government is doing or wants to do, because its objective is to collect all of the information about all of the people all the time, right? Um, and although I know some of you will hand me a tinfoil hat when I say that, um, I think that's the natural conclusion of trying, of having such a fear of homegrown terrorism that you want to make sure that you, you've got, um, you've got the whole country. Covered, right? And so by poking a few holes in this surveillance net, um, I think uh, that the activist community um, will tee up a very interesting question, right? And that question is, can you opt out at all, right? What will happen as a result of these efforts, right? One option is that, you know, this, the activists declare victory and everything runs along fine. The other option is that the federal government comes in and installs its own surveillance equipment. Right. And there's precedent for this. So, for example, in 2001, shortly after the 9-11 attacks, the FBI decided that it was going to conduct interviews of approximately 5,000 Middle Eastern men living in the United States. And some communities were appalled by this and basically said, the police departments themselves said, for which they deserve credit, right, we've spent a long time cultivating relationships with local law enforcement, with, with these communities. We don't want to sabotage them now by engaging in these sort of baseless interviews with the FBI. And the FBI said, OK, no problem, Portland, right, which is one of the places that had said this. We'll get the interviews done ourselves. So I don't actually know right, what will come of these efforts. Um, but I think the activist community is starting to, to at least poke a stick at the bear. And I think that's a really productive thing to do. Um, not every place has the sophistication of an Oakland or a Seattle or that kind of activist community that can really draft the types of things that they've done. Um, and so my ultimate hope um, is that this is the beginning, right? Um, and that other communities can see what Oakland has done and can essentially copy paste those policies um, and use them in their own communities. Because I think if we can keep, keep doing this, we may be able to affect some real change. Um, so with that, I'll stop and I'll thank you. Um, and I think it would be particularly interesting if folks who've actually worked on this in their communities wanted to say a thing or two about it. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. We have five minutes left for Q&A. So we have only five minutes. Come to the microphones, ask your questions, and see how the answers will be. Such an amazing topic. No one has a question. How come? Please get up, folks. Yeah, great. Please, go ahead. You mentioned that these activists were in liberal, educated cities. And I'm curious how you see that coming over to places like Ferguson, where there aren't such activism communities around. Yeah, you know, I, I think Oakland really benefited from the tech community and the fact that there were people who could, who, who, who weren't thinking for the first time, gee, what kind of sharing restrictions should be put in place, right? So I, I mean, I think the best hope is that um, what they do ends up serving as models, because places like Ferguson, you know, do especially now have activist communities. Um, but but if we could find a way to bridge the gaps between activist communities, I think that would I think that would really help. And you saw that happening in Oakland, right, where you saw these public comment periods and a hundred people would show up, right? You get really disparate communities there. Um, but I think, I think some models is what we really need that can be implemented in other places that don't have the same knowledge base. Thank you very much. This is hugely illuminating. And of course, as Americans, we really appreciate hearing all this summed up. Um, I'm wondering whether there are sort of counterexamples. Are there any cities where we're not seeing the pushback we should and things are really being rolled out? Um, yeah, what are the concerned cities, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think there's more of those cities, unfortunately, than there are of cities that have pushed back. Um, but it's because of the way this stuff gets adopted, right? The local law enforcement agency applies for a federal grant. They get the grant. 
Um, maybe then they have to go to the city council. At that point, they're confronted with a bunch of free money. The city council signs off on it. The technology gets implemented, and we never hear about it again, right? Um, so, you know, overall, the picture is a little bit bleak. Um, but I think Edward Snowden um, has given us an opening here, right? And although his particular revelations were about um, spying by the NSA, um, what you see is city council members w willing to be skeptical about surveillance efforts in a way that they weren't five years ago. Um, and so, um, I, you know, the fact that we're seeing these examples now of pushback, I think, is heartening. Yeah, please, go, go ahead. Hello, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, what do you think um, will the democratical approaches to fight against such surveillance initiative help against the government which seem not to follow democratical rules? I think that's a fair question. If you believe that the government isn't going to follow the rules, then it probably doesn't matter what the rules are. Um, but I guess I'm, um, I'm not so skeptical about about every department as that. I think there are places where these things just haven't been um, put in place, and then if you have the right rules, the police departments will ultimately follow them. And what Oakland did, actually, was impose penalties for violating the rules, right? They created a, a requirement that individual citizens uh, had a private right of action to actually bring a lawsuit um, if the privacy policy they created for their domain awareness center wasn't followed. So um, I do think you know, maybe the courts are allies here. Thanks. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, wow, if you need asylum, come to Germany, <laughs> as I said before. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have less problems with drones right now. So please, great applause for, for her.